Okay, so next we want to discuss heat capacity. And why is that, you might say? The idea is that, you know, in phase transitions, what happens is that some physical quantity or its derivative or it's, it could be the first derivative, it could be the second derivative, or its derivatives you know, become singular. Okay. And what we want to show is that for the Bose-Einstein condensation, so for Bose-Einstein condensation, the <clears throat> CV or the heat capacity is continuous, but its first derivative is not, okay? So in other words, CV, the uh, heat capacity, you know, has like a, it's not differentiable at, um, at t equals to tc, right? So this is not, it's different, it's a, yeah, it's not differentiable at t equals to tc, or that it has some sort of a kink, it had a kink. It had some sort of, you know, at t equals to tc. And, you know, the king can look something like, like this. It can look something like this. It can look something like this. It can look something like this, right? But we'll see that it actually looks something like this, okay? <clears throat> so this is an important lesson because, you know, this fact you know, um, in phase transition, some physical quantity or its derivatives become singular, it's universal. It's universal for any kind of phase transition. So it's a good place to start. All right. So this will involve a little bit of mathematics, nothing very, very hard, but you know, some subtlety. So uh, what we want to do is that we want to start with the equation of, well, we want to look at the um, energy first. Look at the energy. So the expression for energy can be expressed. <clears throat> of course, these are expressions that we don't know exactly in general. We know them in some limit. So we know, for example, this uh, G function in its limit where z goes to one, but we don't know these functions exactly. So this is our energy for the ideal Bose gas, you know, at low temperature. And then what we do is that the heat capacity then is going to be per unit volume. It will be one over V dE by dt. So if I do this, we have to keep in mind that lambda has in it T dependence. So the T derivative will first act on this factor and then it'll act on this factor because Z also depends on uh, T, right? Because Z is fugacity, which is E to the power of beta mu and beta, as you know, is one over KVT. So if I use the Leibniz rule, then I got two terms. The first term, which comes from differentiating t and one over lambda cubed is going to be given by 15 over four k of b divided by lambda cubed g five half 
of z. Okay, so this should be a small z. And then we have another term which comes from taking the derivative of this thing. So there we will have three halves, uh, kb of t by lambda cubed, and then we will have d, g. Now we use the chain rule, because this is not a function of t, it's a function of z. So we take the derivative with respect to z, and then we take the derivative of z with respect to t. Now, this is an interesting expression because we know that um, as, you know, like z goes to one, as t goes to tc, and thereafter, and thereafter, uh, you know, z, um, remains constant. So this means that as we go below t equals to tc, so below t equals to tc, you know, this guy is going to be zero. So that means that below TC, you know, the, oops, sorry. So below TC, the only contribution would be from this term. So this is you know, below TC, but above TC, you know, above TC, both of these terms are valid, are going to contribute. And this is the root of the kink, of the fact that there is a discontinuity, okay? Now, we can figure out what the va value of Z is as we go below TC or as we approach TC, and that can be seen from the expression for N that we derived in uh, like two classes ago. Remember that the number, you know, this is basically where we had to, the number of particles is given by V over lambda cubed, G five halves of Z. And then, you know, this, at low temperature, this this was not this was not accurate, because in low temperature, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, as t went at, at, at as t went to tc, you know, this thing, uh, you know, became uh, this thing became yeah. So this thing became bigger, and this thing became um, constant. And therefore, you know, this thing, um, uh, what was it? Uh, remember how it went is that as T in decreased, um, N, uh, yeah, so sorry, yeah, as T decreased, this became constant and this, uh, you know, this went to zero because it has, you know, uh, t to the power of five halves in it, right? Or three halves, actually. So, so, you know, the way to resolve this was to, you know, realize that, you know, there was another term, which was the contribution from the ground state. And that term, you know, blew up as z went to z1, so that this thing could remain N could remain constant, of course. Um, so what happens is that if I keep N fixed, so N is fixed, and T 
T is going to say um, is, is becoming smaller and smaller. As T is becoming smaller and smaller, Z is going towards one, and therefore this thing becomes bigger and bigger. So because this is fixed, that means this thing becomes zero. And therefore, as T is going towards TC, you know, we can now, you know, use this formula. And from here, we can invert this and we can show that uh, Z approximates, Z approaches its constant value of one minus uh, one over N. So as T goes to zero, you know, as T goes to TC and below, this is the value that Z approaches. Okay, so, and this is what we're using here to argue that under TC, you know, there's no contribution from this guy. Okay? So this is a bit of a subtle argument. Uh, so under TC, so there are two scenarios now. So under TC, the, uh, the heat capacity is going to be given by minus 15 V KB by four lambda cubed uh, zeta by five halves. Of course, this became constant. And this is go as goes by T to the power three halves. Now, what about above TC? So above, before we go there, let's just like, we familiarize ourselves with the function gn, the bilogarithm or the di, yeah, bi, di logarithm, I think, function. And this is going to be summed over. Yeah, my dog got bitten today by two street dogs. Oh, sorry, I was so angry. Okay, um, so this function, so see that this is a very nice function, it's a, but it's, it's a monotonic function, right? Uh, yeah. So this is a monotonic, which means that, you know, as um, Z increases to one, G also increases and therefore for Z less than one, G of five halves of Z will be less than G of five halves at one. Why is it monotonic? Because it's, it's just like sums of powers, right? And every term here is monotonic and all the coefficients are positive. Right? So that's why it's a monotonic function. Okay, so, so that means that as T increases or decreases, sorry, uh, you know, Z, um, yeah, sorry, not, it means also that as T decreases, Z increases, right? Because as we saw, when T was very high, Z was zero. When T is very small, Z becomes one. So around the, the region that we're interested in, DZ by DT is negative. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that the second term the sign, you know, uh, that that as we approach, uh, um,
right. So if T is decreasing and dz by dt is negative, so the second term uh, has a uh, has a minus sign, right? So okay. So what I want to show is the following. What I want to show is that uh, is that T equal to TC is a a maximum. Okay. So uh, how do I do this? So if I look at it around T equals to TC, just you know, just a bit around T equals to TC, you know, this has some value. And you know we know that below t equals to t c this thing is uh, you know has this sort of behavior, and therefore you know it kind of you know it kind of increases as we as we get here, and as we go through t equals to t c, I mean this term is going to keep on doing like this, right? But the idea here is that, you know, this term, as you increase uh, t equals to tc, this term will have the opposite sign so that, you know, this actually goes down. And this is done by showing, as we have shown below, because this thing has is negative. Okay. Is it, does that make sense? Hello? Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. So, right. So the sign here is very important. Okay. So, so all we have done is that we have we have shown that you know t equals to tc is maximum. We haven't shown that it's a it, there's a spike there. So um, for that we need uh, a bit more subtle argument, and let's uh, you know let's do that. So from the definition of g n of z. You know, it's easy to see that if you take the derivative with respect to z, then what do you do? You just like reduce. If you if you take the derivative with respect to z, what you're doing is that you're reducing this by one, but you're also bringing down a factor of m, and therefore this becomes one, right? And um, and then what you do is that you can just multiply, you know, the numerator and the denominator by z. And then you have over here factor of z. And in here, inside the summation, you have still m1 goes to this. But here you've got, uh, you, you have z to the power m. And here you have m to the power n minus 1. And therefore, this thing is 1 over z g to the power g n minus 1 of z. So you have this recursion relationship that the derivative of g n of z with respect to z is 1 over z g of n minus 1 over z. Okay. So, so what we're interested in, we are just interested in this function around t equals to tc. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to evaluate this for all general z, all general t. So what we're interested in is the derivative of g five halves, right? So if I'm interested in the g five halves from this formula, I see that 
what I really have to do is I have to look at G three half around Z equals to Z one, right? And that as T goes to TC, you know, D of G's, uh, G, sorry, of G uh, five halves by DZ, you know, this just goes to, this is just one, this just goes to G three halves of Z, uh, actually with Z equals to one, which is nothing but the zeta function evaluated at three halves, right? So at t equals to tz, we can just replace, and this is a nice function, so we are not ex expecting anything funky here. We can just replace this by that value, by, you know, around that, uh, we can just replace it by something like this. So the whole magic of phase transition is actually contained in this guy. So, okay, so now let me just switch to my other lecture notes. All right. Right. Yeah. So what we want to do is that we want to see or we want to show we want to see how Z behaves um, around, uh, say, Z, Z goes to 1, okay? Or how its derivative behaves. Now, the way to see it is actually to look at say g half, so g half, if I look at the definition of g half, this is has a, a factor of the gamma function and then zero to infinity and then d of x, x minus half by one over z e to the part x minus one. I'm just using the definition of g half. Now, <clears throat> it turns out that as z goes to one, this function actually has a singularity. And near that point, that singular part of the function is going to dominate, right? I mean, if I have a function which is going to infinity very quickly, you know, whatever finite part it has, it doesn't matter. It's going to be dominated by this part, right? So, you know, if a function f of x has, say, 1 over x plus 3, you know, as x goes to 0, it'll be dominated by this part. And, uh, you know, or this part is just not going, it's going to be finite. It's not going to, uh, you know, contribute anything. It's, it, you know, and especially when we are ticket, we will have to be looking at derivatives and stuff. This is the part that we're going to look at. So starting from this, you know, you can show that the so g half of z. <clears throat> can be written as this. And there's the integral can be, you know, we can change the integral from uh, around the zero. And the rest. And the rest is actually finite even when z goes to one. Now it is this part, which is the singular part. And if I now, you know, I can factor this out. If I factor this out, it'll be Z over, you know, gamma of half, zero to infinity, D of X, X to the power minus half. And then I'll have one 
minus z plus one, sorry, plus x, sorry, plus x, I've rearranged the denominator. So this guy is now this minus z, okay? And then what we can do is that we can uh, change variables from u to x, uh, one over x minus z. And if I do that, then, you know, g half of z has the form of 2z divided by 1 minus z. And then the rest of the stuff here is finite. So it's 0 to epsilon d of u times 1 plus u squared plus the finite part. So it's this part. It's this guy, which is going to blow up, right? So all of this is to kind of show us that as j as you know g of z sorry g of half this this has the form of z divided by square root of one minus z as z goes to one so but g of half is related to g three halves through a derivative so if I take g of 3 half of z and do a Taylor expansion around z equals to 1, then at z equals to 1, I'm going to have, you know, uh, this as its value. And the Taylor expansion is going to have the first derivative of this guy. But the first derivative of this guy is related to this thing through the recursion relationship. And therefore, we can write this as, uh, sorry, some constant that I don't care about right now, minus one over z by half. Okay. So this is the formula I wanted to derive. And then what we can do is that we can just like uh, massage this a little bit and re-express z in terms of these things. And if I do this, it's, uh, you know, this is one minus one over a squared, you know, a zeta of three halves. And then we can use the equation for uh, the equation of, uh, for numbers. And, you know, you, and a few more lines of algebra, you know, you just express everything in terms of T and when the dust settles, you get 1 minus b, some positive content, constant, t minus tc by tc. So this is the behavior of z for t greater than tc. Okay? So what we have done here is that here you see we had g3 halves of z, but we replace that by the expression for n. Because if you remember, you know, uh, the expression for n involved g3 halves. For t greater than tc. Okay? So this is the expression. So see that for t, uh, okay, so so this is the expression for, uh, so if I now use this in, uh, you know, dz over dt and then bring everything together, what I get is I get an expression for cv. And cv has a part which is, you know, uh, universal, which is like, you know, is applicable for both t less than tc and greater than tc, and that's this guy. And then we have, um, you know, a part which is only valid for t greater than tc, so let me just put that by t minus tc is a theta function. And that part is some positive constant b times 
T minus TC over TC. And if I were to graph this, what would it look like? It would look something like CV, this is say TC, and this goes to zero at zero temperature, but at TC, you know, there's a kink and then it goes to this. Okay, so, so here we see that CV, D of CV by D of T, you know, this thing doesn't exist. And this is the uh, hallmark of phase transition, that there is a phase transition here. Okay. So um, any questions before we wrap this up? We have, I have, I'll have a few more uh, things to say. Um, sir, from the origin to TC, is it a straight line or is it? No, no, it's a power law. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it's, a, it's a power law of the form three. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. And then I guess. okay. It's 1.5 or something. So it's not very, it's not very strong. Okay, so um, 